The Alvarez Fellowship is for postdocs at LBL to apply computing to scientific problems as Luis Alvarez pioneered. Uh, today I was asked to talk about what I'm working on with this fellowship. And although I never met uh, Luis Alvarez, there's a story from his autobiography that nicely summarizes the work that I'm working on. And the story is actually from Luis Alvarez's college days. And he's describing when he has this big chemistry final. And the results of this final depend on this experiment that he needs to do. Unfortunately, he ends up contaminating this experiment. So he's forced to kind of guess at the answer using his intuition and the results of previous experiments. And he ends up having great intuition, and he's right. Uh, and he gets a good grade. But he really doesn't like the experience. In fact, what he writes is, I imagined with horror a lifetime in chemistry always guessing the answer. <laughs> And so he became a physicist, and the rest is history. Um, <laughs> so, so my problem actually relates very much to this. I'm not in chemistry. I'm in a very uh, related field called material science. And material scientists work on all sorts of problems, but one thing they work on is renewable energy. So they work on things like trying to find new solar cell materials that are cost-effective and high efficiency. Or in my case, they work on finding uh, materials for new lithium-ion batteries so that you can drive for 200 miles without having to recharge it, that sort of thing. The problem is that material science actually takes a lot of guesswork, just as Luis Alvarez said you know, many decades ago. So if I'm a material scientist, I'm this orange person, there are a lot of things I don't know that I need to guess. For example, what are the properties of known compounds? We know from databases that we have that there are about 100,000 compounds that exist that we know that people have made, but the properties of them are largely unknown. So we know silicon exists, we know titanium dioxide exists, we know lead titanium exists, but we don't know out of these 100,000 compounds which one might be the next great battery which one might be the next great solar cell. So that's one problem that we have. Another thing that requires guesswork is what types of new materials might exist. So I said there are about 100,000 that we know of. People find new ones every year. But really, it's going into the lab and mixing chemicals and trying things out. And most of the time, it doesn't work. And sometimes it works, and you get lucky. So that's a very slow process. Uh, and lastly, relating most directly to technology is how do you find a good compound for the job? If you're designing a new solar cell material, for example, it doesn't just need to be high efficiency, it needs to be low cost, it needs to be easy to transport, it can't degrade in the sun, and it's very hard to design materials that meet all of these properties that you need to implement into technology. So right now, experience and intuition have really been the guides in chemistry and in material science, and this has led to really slow materials development. Usually it takes many decades to develop new materials for an application. So the idea behind this project uh, funded by the Alvarez Fellowship is to help remove the guesswork from materials design. And the model that we really want is that we want to feed lots of data to materials researchers, and then based on that data, the materials researchers can come up with new materials for the next great solar cell or whatever they're working on in much more rapid time frames. The problem, of course, is where do you get the data? Uh, experiments have been pretty slow in generating materials data. So this is where the computing angle comes in. Now, it turns out there's a type of calculations called density functional theory calculations, and they give you pretty accurate materials properties from first principles. The way that it works is you define your material, so these are atoms in a periodic box, and you can just tell it whatever atoms you want. Uh, you feed it into a computing cluster, and basically it solves some equations. These are Schrodinger's equations. And you get fundamental properties of your material. These fundamental properties can later be turned into engineering properties. For example, the band structure relates for solar cell materials to how efficient you can possibly make the solar cell material. So we now have a way with computers to actually generate materials data. And the great thing about computers is that they're scalable in the sense that if you have twice as many computers, you can do twice as many materials. And if you have three times as many computers, you can do three times as many materials. So you can kind of see where having large computers can be used to, to generate lots of materials data and try and solve this materials data problem. So let me show you how this relates to a real example. So we talked before about lithium ion batteries and how they're trying to use them in electric vehicles, but they need things with more capacity that let you drive further. Uh, the way that a lithium-ion battery works is that you have lithium, and it shuttles between two electrodes, which are the anode and the cathode. When you discharge the battery, it moves from the anode to the cathode, 
And the electrolyte prevents the electron from moving here as well, and the electron goes through the external circuit and does work. When you charge the battery, the reverse happens, the lithium ion moves back the other way, and the electron moves the other way as well. So really you have lithium ions shuttling between two things, the anode and the cathode. And we're focusing on finding new materials for the cathode because the cathode is expensive. It has cobalt, which is an expensive metal. Uh, and it's also very heavy. So a lot of the weight of your battery comes from these heavy cathode materials. So what we were looking for is really new uh, cathode materials that would be kind of like lithium sponges. A good cathode material is like a lithium sponge. You want it to be light, you want it to be compact, you want it to be as cheap as possible, and you want it to very reversibly take in lots of lithium back and forth and back and forth uh, without degrading. So what we were doing for this project is trying to use computing to find new cathode materials that would be like great lithium sponges. So there are three main components of a lithium ion battery cathode. Uh, the first one is lithium, and you need the lithium as your lithium ion source. The second one is a metal, and the metal is what's responsible for accepting the electron and donating the electron as you charge and discharge the battery. Uh, and lastly, you need something else, and that something else gives you negative charge to balance out the positive charge of your lithium and your metal. And it also for forms like a structural framework for your material. You can think of your material kind of like a hotel, uh, and the lithium and the metals are like guests in your hotel. So really, before, what you would have to do is you would have to guess what are the best metals, what are the best frameworks to use, and what are the best ratios to mix lithium metal and the framework. And it had very little success. I mean, there's only really been a few cathode materials that have found any sort of commercial success. So then what we did is we actually unleashed the computers on the problem. And what this plot shows is about a year and a half of computing. So we started computing in about January of 2008, and we finished you know, around July of 2009. And in that time, we computed about 20,000 different cathode materials. So these are different metals, different ratios of lithium and metal and anion and different anions. And these categories are the different anions that we tried. So really what this allowed to, us to do was to try in a year and a half much more candidates than we could try if we were only to do experiments. Uh, and then we actually narrowed down to three candidates that we thought were very promising, and we made these candidates in the lab. So these were materials that were designed inside a computer and actually made in a lab. And now theoretical physics has you know, a good history of people making predictions and you know, experimentalists actually confirming those predictions. In the materials field, it's actually more rare to have an instance where someone predicts a material and then it's actually made. So this was uh, very promising for us. I'll talk briefly about one of the materials. It's this lithium uh, metal phosphocarbonate that we found. It's a completely new chemistry. No one had ever heard of lithium metal phosphocarbonates before. Uh, it potentially has 40% more capacity than one of the current cathode materials on the market. We did rate testing on it, which is how fast you can charge and discharge the battery. And what we were finding was that even if you take six minutes to charge and six minutes to discharge, you can still get a good amount of capacity out of your battery. The problem with the material right now is that we're not getting all of the capacity that we expect. Uh, what the chart on the right basically shows is the x-axis is kind of a measure of how much capacity you get. And in theory, we expect about twice as much as what we're getting from the experiment. So we're working on the, the experimental formulation to try and get more of the capacity out. So this was an example that we found, kind of a proof of principle, that we can actually use computers to accelerate the search for new materials. But really, it was just one application and one research group. So how could we use this principle to benefit the greater community of materials researchers? And what we came up with is this uh, idea called the Materials Project. And what it is is a website of materials uh, and their properties that we've computed. And we call it Materials Project, and it's materialsproject.org. You can go on it now. And it's completely free. Anyone can use it. Uh, and you can basically find a, a list of all these materials. Right now, there's about 15,000 and different properties of those materials. And there's also tools for helping you analyze the materials properties. Uh, how will people use this? We just launched it about a month ago. Uh, I personally have used the website to look for new materials that will actually help reduce mercury pollution from coal power plants. Uh, a few colleagues and I have used it to look for sodium ion batteries, which are an alternative to lithium batteries because sodium is more earth abundant than lithium. Uh, and then another colleague of mine actually used the data and she saw errors uh, from some of the calculations, uh, which are part of the theory, and then she went back and she improved the theory based on the errors that she was seeing. So this has been used in many different ways now, uh, internally by us. We've actually had instances now of outside users finding the website and actually doing research with it. 
We uh, recently found a paper by another lithium battery group. They were working on the anode, which is the other half of the uh, lithium ion battery. And they were an experimental group, so they never really did computations. But they were able to use computations from our website to analyze their experiments, and they published uh, our computational results alongside their experimental results in a paper. Uh, we had another user send us a really nice email saying that he was able to reproduce uh, in 15 minutes with our website what took him three months to do earlier. Uh, so, he, so we're starting to get lots of encouragement for the site, and we're, we're trying to grow it uh, more and more. Uh, and as David mentioned in the introduction, uh, we're partnering with NERSC, which is the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. And what they really specialize is in these large-scale computing problems. And what they've helped us do is that previously we were computing on the equivalent of about 200 laptops uh, or one computing cluster, and we were making slow progress on materials with that uh, much resources. What they're really helping us do is uh, compute on their production machines like Hopper, and that's the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of laptops. I mean, it's a crazy amount of computational power. And what that'll really allow us to do is to plow through all these different materials, all the known ones that exist, and compile really many properties of all of those materials. So the collaboration is growing. It started off at MIT, where I used to be, and uh, also LBL was a part of the founding of it. Uh, and again, we included NERSC, and now we have partners in Belgium and also in Kentucky. So returning back to the beginning, uh, really the problem that we're trying to solve is something that was identified by Luis Alvarez many, many decades ago, that there's too much guesswork in chemistry and that it needs to be removed. It's really horrible working in chemistry when there's all this guesswork involved. Uh, and we're actually using methods that he really helped pioneer, uh, computing, collaboration, uh, sharing of data. So we really think that, that using those methods is what's contributing to the success of the project. Great. Thank you.